Well, notice the title of this slide, and let's reconsider the familiar. When a conductor moves in a magnetic field, we have an EMF induced. Due to what? The magnetic force is acting on the charges. The moving charge is in the conductor because the conductor is moving. We have a B field, length L. We got that magnetic force, as we've been calling it, because of the motion of this charge that's in the conductor moving to the right. We have the QVB force. And that is countered eventually by the QE force, the electric field, <laughs> acting on the separated Q. All that's very fine and understandable. The FB is equal to QV cross B. And so we have, when we have uh, this force countered by the QE, we have V voltage potential difference established across here equal to E field times L. E is equal to VB, so that's VBL. So EMF induced is BLV. We've covered that already. It all seems reasonable. We got these moving charges in a magnetic field and that's what magnetic forces act on, right? But we've also established that a changing magnetic flux induces an EMF. And it may not be so simple to understand, or intuitively obvious at least, what causes the charges to move. You have a changing magnetic flux, and that's going to cause charges to separate in a conductor just because the flux changes. Let's check it out. Now, you may not think that there's a problem here, but I think there is. So consider a long solenoid of n turns per length carrying current i, and it's a changing current. There's a di dt that's not equal to zero. There's a single loop encircling this solenoid, area A, and we see a deflection in a current meter in that loop when there is a non-zero di dt. Now, why is this the case? Consider first that the B field is going to the right. Validate that by wrapping that solenoid. Bring your fingers underneath and around in the direction of current, and your thumb points to the right. Okay, so there's the B field, but it's contained inside the solenoid. And it's boonie, bunny. B is equal to mu zero ni. That's the size of the magnetic field. But it's contained inside the solenoid itself. I repeat, that's really important. That's where the magnetic field is. And if this is a long, mag a long solenoid, B field comes out, it loops way around, doesn't go through this material. And if you want a pure example of that, then go ahead and wrap this thing around into a toroid. And then we definitely don't have any magnetic field outside of the loop. It's all contained inside. Now, since the current is increasing, Faraday's law says we have an EMF equal to minus d phi sub e dt. So there is a change in flux because the B field is changing because the current is changing. All, again, contained inside the solenoid. But there's no B field at the location of the loop. Here's the loop. I already said that. There's no magnetic field there. So the big problem is, the big question before us is what pushes those charges around the loop. For the current to flow, you need a force to move the charges. Now, in the past, it was fine. We have QV cross B. We have a charge moving in a magnetic field. We have the ILB force, a current in a magnetic field. The problem now is it can't be a magnetic force because the conductor is not only not moving, but the important thing is it's not even in a B field. This conductor is not even in a B field. It's isolated in space, basically. And yet, current flows. Well, there's only really one conclusion when you exclude all the obvious. <laughs> the conclusion it has to be some sort of electric field that's the result of the changing magnetic field. A changing magnetic field caused there to be a current flow even though there's no magnetic phenomena here at the location of the loop. So hopefully you feel the import of this little discrepancy we have here. So let's look at a cross section of the solenoid. So we have this charge and we want it to go around the loop. To do that you have to push it around. The charge will not do it all by itself. So the E field must push, push it around. When it does that it does work on the charge. How much work does it do? Take the integral.
closed integral of e dot dl. When we integrate around this path, we get an e field shoving it around. That's equal to the emf as we go around the loop. And it's work per charge. And that's not equal to zero. Can't be equal to zero or the charge wouldn't move. Therefore, this E field is non-conservative. Normally, when we have a circuit, we don't just have the charge moving around, but somewhere in here we have a charge pump. So as the E field is doing positive work, it's matched by the negative work done on the charge to pump up the charge so that it can then go around the circuit again. And in the entire loop, we have a we have conservative, basically it's a conservative situation where no work is being done in moving the charge from one point throughout a path back to the same point. But here we literally can have this charge continue to move around. This charge can move, there's no charge pump, work is being done on it. So that's a non-conservative situation. Now, putting it mildly, this is not an E-field that we're familiar with. Nevertheless, we can write Faraday's law in yet another form. So we have that the closed integral of E dot dl has to do now with an EMF that's induced. So it's minus d p sub e d t. Wonderful little expression. Note that it's for stationary integration path only. Basically, if the integration path is moving, it can change the flux in ways that make this whole expression indeterminate. So in any case, that is a new and fundamental form of Faraday's law. Now, because of cylindrical symmetry, the E field is tangent to and the same magnitude at every point on the conducting loop. Taking a cross section of this solenoid, and seeing the magnetic field here going inside, going into the screen, okay, and there's a current flowing around like this, and it's increasing, produces an electric field tangent to and constant in magnitude at every point. This is the non electrostatic field that's pushing the charge around. Now, symmetry would also permit the electric field to be radial. But Gauss would say, no, no, no. And you know why? Because if we do a Gaussian surface anywhere around here, we're going to enclose no charge. There's no charge enclosed, so it has to be tangent. Moreover, you wouldn't get the charges moving around this loop with a radial electric field. So closed integral at e dot dl is minus d phi sub b dt. And that's just the path length, 2 pi r, times this constant value e. So at this point, we can specify the electric field is 1 over 2 pi r d phi sub e dt. Not worried about direction at the moment. Don't want to confuse us any more than we already are. <laughs> so to summarize this, we can do so as follows. A changing magnetic field produces an electric field, which causes there to be an induced EMF in the loop. That E field, the nature of it, it's not electrostatic. There is no way that you can construct that E field using charge distributions. You can go ahead and try, but you won't succeed. Can't be done. Three other points. Namely, closed integral of E dot dl is not equal to zero, so it's not a conservative force field. Moreover, potential doesn't have any meaning there's no potential energy function. You can move a charge to different positions and you can't say anything about its potential energy as you can with electrostatic charge distributions. You can move the charge around in that kind of electric field and its potential energy is different at different places. Not so here, it's just sitting there and this non-electrostatic field can come and move it around without changing its energy. Okay, really weird. Finally, the kind of force we're talking about, well, force is equal to Q sub E for charge distributions, can be equated with the force for non-electrostatic E field, in this case, which is produced by a change in magnetic flux. It still produces the force, QE, but it's from that different 
electric field. We really see now some truly huge implications of what we just discussed, namely that a changing electric field produces a magnetic field. We saw this with Amper's Law in our discussion of displacement currents, the increasing electric flux between the plates of a capacitor and the resulting magnetic field that can be measured there. And now we see that a changing magnetic field produces an electric field, a non-electrostatic electric field using Faraday's law. So don't let that pass by you without some uh, sense of profundity because this is, in brief, the essence of the foundation of electromagnetic theory. All right, let's put this into a little example that's kind of useful. Show you how easy it is to work with these amazing realities. Well, we have a solenoid and is a thousand turns per length per meter and DIDT is a hundred amps per second solenoid area four square centimeters. Let's determine the EMF induced in that wire loop and then the magnitude of the E field that causes that EMF. So that's actually going to be pretty easy. EMF is minus d phi sub dt, which is the changing flux. We know flux is B times A. So here we have the B field times A. There's the A. A is a constant. The B field from the solenoid, mu zero n. And we don't care about the actual value of the B field at any point. It's the change the rate at which it's changing. So we have mu zero n di dt, not i. Notice the i is not in there. It doesn't matter what the current is, it's the rate at which the current changes, okay? So that's mu zero n, the area, times di dt gives us 50 microvolts. All right, so that's the induced EMF. Now the electric field, this mysterious electric field produced by the changing magnetic field. Well, the integral, closed integral v dot dl, is equal to 2 pi r, that's path length, times that constant e. So, and that's uh, the induced EMF, which we already know. So the EMF, the electric field, I'm sorry, is EMF over 2 pi r. There's the numbers, there's the value. This many volts per meter solves the problem. Well, let's finish this video with one last little topic. Oh, yes, thank God, let's finish this video. It's called eddy currents, and you can kind of envision a river with swirling little regions, swirling eddies. Induced currents can circulate in very complex ways in the material, the volume of a conductor of some sort, depending on the nature of the motion in the magnetic field. So here's a Here's our like Faraday disk. But we just have a magnetic field confined to a certain region here. We're gonna spin it around. We can think of this particular sector passing through the magnetic field and then a little bit later, it's over here. So it sweeps through this magnetic field. While its material is sweeping through, a current is induced. And we can figure out that from the QVB force. Put the fingers into the screen thumb to the left, palm goes down, so the current is caused to flow down like this. But then this swings out of the magnetic field, so the current decays. So we get these, these eddies that take place. And also from that current, we have the ILB force. Okay, and that force is in this direction. Make sure that makes sense. Let's see, current down, Magnetic field into the screen, so fingers into the screen, current down, and indeed the palm points to the right. So again, the after passing through there, it decays out, so we have these 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 swirling currents that are can be very complex in structure. Well now there's an application to this idea. It's in the form of a metal detector. So in a metal detector, we have, say, a disc. Actually, it's got a coil in it. And we send a pulse down this disc. The pulse goes into the coil, produces a current. 
that makes an increasing or pulse of magnetic field that starts with zero and rises to a maximum value very rapidly, so the magnetic field is going up. Now that, if there happens to be a chunk of conductor, that's going to induce a current in that conductor in such a way that the conductor is going to say, I don't like having a magnetic field, a flux, change through me, so I'm going to, I'm going to produce a current that's going to oppose that change. That's the Lenz Law concept. So it's going to produce a current that's going to make a magnetic field going up the opposite way. Well, that's simple to figure out. Your thumb goes up, your right hand tells you the direction of that current. It's looking from above counterclockwise. So if you wrap your fingers around this, you'll realize your thumb points up. So that's the direction of current induced, but then the pulse is gone. And this metallic or of, of some other conductor has produced a magnetic field that's now going to decay. That magnetic field is going to go down because the pulse is gone. And this magnetic flux is imposed upon the big coil here of the detector. And so that flux goes down. So that induces an EMF in the original large coil that causes the coil to try and oppose the change. Well, it's trying to go down. So the induced current has to be in such a direction to try and keep this magnetic field going. So that's going to be counterclockwise. And if you do the right hand rule on that, you'll see your thumb points up trying to maintain this decaying induced B field. All right? And so therefore, we get a pulse going back up and the detector goes beep, 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 or whatever it does. It can be some very sophisticated sensors system or, or subsequent information it tells you, signal level, um, shapes, probable type of material, etc. Uh, but that is, in brief, how metal detectors work, and that will conclude this particular video.